Welcome to Sword of the Spirit, written and presented by Colin Dye, Senior Minister of Kensington Temple and leader of London City Church. Sword of the Spirit is a dynamic teaching series equipping the believers of today to build the disciples of tomorrow. We pray that you find these programs inspiring and a catalyst in deepening your knowledge of God, your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, and your intimacy with the Holy Spirit. Hello and welcome to the Sword of the Spirit, a school of ministry in the Word and the Spirit. Our topic is Worship in Spirit and Truth. And in previous programs, I laid the foundation of this as revealed in the Old Testament and showed how that New Testament worship has t been totally transformed by Jesus. No longer are there special people or places or seasons or acts of worship that God requires. These have been fulfilled in Jesus. And so when we approach the Father in the name of Jesus, we approach in spirit and truth. In other words, it's the reality of true spiritual worship because God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. We've also seen that in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul speaks of different ways that God draws us close to him by his spirit. And these are actually responses that come up in our hearts, they well up in our hearts spontaneously because the Holy Spirit lives there. And what's very interesting is that often these are focused on three Aramaic words and Paul was writing in Greek so it's surprising that he uses the Aramaic words which are well known to us as, as followers of Christ Amen, Maranatha and Abba three Aramaic words which suggest that these words were frequent in the early church used frequently in the worship of the early church and I find these words very interesting because they all speak about what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. First of all, that word Abba, it speaks about our Abba relationship with God. The Spirit enables us to cry, Abba, Father, and that's at the very heart of worship. It's the most fundamental thing of all, that we know God as Father, Abba, through Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. And of course, the word Amen is very clear almost in every language it means yes so be it and the Holy Spirit moves us from within as we bear witness to the truth of whom we worship Amen and of course Maranatha means even so come Lord Jesus and the Lord is coming soon and it's the Spirit of God that causes our hearts to yearn for the coming of Jesus and so all of this is found in the Apostle Paul's teaching as he writes his letters to various early church groups. So we're going to have a little, look a little bit more deeply at what Paul has to say about worship in his letters. Paul's letters are full of instruction, correction, and direction to very young churches, and they deal generally then with the topics of personal and public worship. Paul never gives any detailed instructions about worship and never therefore imposes a precise order or form of worship. Instead, he simply pleads for simplicity and freedom in worship and sets all his teaching about ethics and doctrine against a background of worship. Those points in your manual are very, very significant, very important. Let's go through them again. Number one, Paul does not set any pattern of worship to say, this is how you do it, and you've got to do it this way and no other way. He doesn't do it. Neither does he say there is one right way of worshipping. Instead, he focuses on attitudes. He, he mentions that uh, he emphasizes freedom and liberty, spontaneity and doubtless the, the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the first thing. And the second thing he does is that he sets everything else that happens in the context of worship. Ethics, the call to a holy life, is set in the context of worship. And worship is set in the context of celebrating who you are and what he has done for you, what God has done for you, so that your lifestyle is, is, uh, flows out of a, of a heart that's renewed and a heart that's ignited with the passion of God expressed in worship. And so it's so important to see again this link between worship and life and living. Worship is a lifestyle lifestyle. 
and your lifestyle should be a worshipful lifestyle. And that's not just those moments of private or public and corporate devotion where we perform certain acts of praise and of worship, but the whole of your life is to be lived in an, as an act of worship, as he says in Romans 12, verse 1, to present our bodies as living sacrifices. And so our lifestyle is set in the context of worship, and so also the doctrinal teaching that he presents is set in the context of worship. I think of that passage in, in the book of Romans when, when Paul has been expounding God's purposes for his covenant people and how that as the Jews hardened their hearts and God used that as an occasion to bring the Gentiles in and is going to have mercy again on the Jews and it's all working together and he just stands back and he says, oh, great is the glory and the riches of his grace. It's so wonderful. And he presents that doxology. And so there is form and shape here. As the Apostle Paul teaches, he is never merely teaching doctrine. He is always bringing people into an encounter with God and an experience of worship with the living God. And especially as we see worship in its broadest context, as it's the heart set on fire with a passion for God and the mouth expressing that in praise and worship and the whole of, the, of that attitude being reflected in the bodily stance and, and worship and dance that God ordains uh, that we should experience in his presence. We see that uh, Paul emphasizes a great deal about baptism and the Lord's Supper. And he relates these sacraments, we may call them, to public worship. And we look at these in detail in the seminar, Glory in the Church. But we should recognize in the context of worship that uh, uh, the Lord's Supper particularly were, was celebrated in the context of public worship in the, early, in the, church of the, in the life of the early church. Uh, one of the important things, I think, that is preserved throughout Paul's letters is the freedom of worship that we are to experience in Christ. In the letter to the Corinthians in particular, Paul deals with many issues which would have been of an urgent, pressing concern to the, this fast-growing church in the ancient Greek world. It seems that the church have been trying to put Paul's teaching into practice, but there have been practical difficulties that begin to arise. Difficulties which have troubled congregations down throughout the ages. Uh, several principles or several things he, he, he tackles. Freedom and worship. Morals and worship. Spiritual gifts and worship. Paul teaches that in the city, uh, uh, rather we see that uh, the... Uh, Things that Paul taught the believers in the city of Corinth he had been taught also in the rural churches of Galatia. And the main points of this was that in Christ there are no distinctions between class, race, or gender. And Christ has given believers a new freedom. Now, in terms of public worship, this means that Paul allowed slaves, Gentiles, and women to play a full part in every aspect of ministry which was utterly contrary to the Jewish customs of his day. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, Paul had passed on traditions to this effect to the Christian church, uh, to the church in Corinth. He says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So it seems that the church members had observed these traditions, but as they did so, they had misunderstood the true nature of Christian freedom. Apparently, some women were taking a leading part in the church services, and they were doing in God's presence things that they would not have done in front of their pagan neighbors. For example, the custom of their day laid down that respectable women did not appear in public with their heads uncovered. And uh, the Corinthian believers argued that they were free. And if we're free, we're free from social rules. Paul said we're free, so we're free. We can express this freedom in the church. Now, Paul recognized this was a similar problem to the one that had arisen over the, in the church over food bought in pagan temples. Now, in Corinth, the only meat available for sale 
came from the animals which had been offered in sacrifice at the various temples. The Jews would not supply the Christians with meat, one supposes, and the Christians did not want to conform to the Jewish regulations. Church members therefore had to buy meat from pagan temples or go without. Now some believers thought it was wrong to eat this meat. And by eating that meat, they were endorsing and encouraging pagan worship. And others said, well, no, we're free. We're free to do this. Now, Paul, writing to them, it's in the passages 1 Corinthians 8, verse 1, to 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, he makes four basic points. He says, yes, you are free to eat food offered to pagan gods, because those gods do not exist. However, you must have a brotherly concern for believers who see the matter differently, and don't yet have that freedom in their conscience and their understanding in their, in their minds uh, that I'm talking about. He says they don't always see it that way. They don't understand that. And therefore, you have to be ready to forego your freedom and to not to eat this, this meat out of consideration for other believers. The second thing he says is that this was the, the kind of concession that Paul had made in a different sphere. He had the right to be maintained financially by the believers. As an apostle, he says, it's been ordained that those who preach the gospel should live by the gospel. But he says, I have voluntarily replaced myself under restrictions so that my message might be accepted by all kinds of people. He says, I don't want the fact that I am owed a salary to prevent me from preaching the gospel. And I have the freedom for this, but I won't exercise that freedom and liberty uh, but I am going to work with my own hands so that I'll pay my own way so that people will have no doubt in, in their mind at all what my motives are. And so he reminds them about that. He says, I am free as an apostle to have you pay my salary, but when I came to you, I didn't, didn't, didn't do that. I robbed other churches in many ways, he said. <laughs> well, he didn't steal from churches, but he was saying that as an, as a, as an expression that he was saying, I took from them what you should have given to me so that I could present the gospel to you free of charge. And in the same way that I forewent my liberty in order to minister to you, so you should have consideration and concern for others concerning this matter, uh, not just of, of, uh, of eating meat, but also in uh, you, the way you conduct yourselves in worship. Then thirdly, he says, Christians should recognize that there could be real dangers in participating in this pagan worship. They could not share in the Lord's Supper one day and a pagan feast the next without there being grave spiritual consequences. And this actually is very, very interesting teaching. It shows that our worship should be pure. We should not engage in idolatrous practices in our worship. And there are many things that border on this in the Christian churches. In some churches where statues are used, uh, perhaps in, in their minds of purity, just to remind them of, of, of these people, it's so easy for that to turn into worship, to go into churches where you light candles in front of statues. That is, that is so close to pagan idolatry, even if when you trace it back in people's minds, that was not their original intention. It can degenerate into that so easily. That's why in the time of the Reformation, all these things were done away with uh, in the church so that people would worship God in spirit and truth. How can you make a physical representation of spirit if God is spirit? The first commandment says you shall worship only God. The second commandment shows you how you should worship him by not making graven images. And so we must be very careful that however we worship God, that we keep it free and pure from all forms of idolatry and anything that could so easily degenerate into idolatry. And uh, so the, 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 it teaches us about idolatry. It also teaches us about how demonized uh, Christians can become if they get involved in pagan idolatry. And so he says, you think you're going to participate in the Lord's table and at the same time go and participate in the t table of devils? You are going to be in fellowship and participate in demons if you participate in pagan worship. So this shows you how dangerous it is to be involved in any form of pagan idolatry. And that's why people coming to Christ from different religions are encouraged to destroy every link with that previous paganism and that previous idolatrous connection. 
And uh, those things can have a, an ongoing effect in people's lives as it is a demonic entrance point into people's lives. And the third thing we see about what Paul says here is that the Lord's Supper is the opposite side of this. It's the other side of the coin. If you participate in a pagan festival, you get yourself exposed to pagan, to, to demonic spirits. When you participate in the Lord's Supper, you are participating in the body and blood of Jesus Christ in a real way. The Holy Spirit will meet you in that place of worship around the Lord's table uh, in a very, very special and real way. And more of that teaching comes in glory in the church in that uh, seminar. And then the fourth thing that Paul says concerning this is the general principle is not to do anything which would lead other believers astray, even things which are right in themselves. So he comes then to the case of the Corinthian women, where Paul says that they were offending the society that they were trying to reach rather than uh, uh, other Christian believers. And so the point here is that Paul says, in the society in which you live, if a woman does not have her head covered or have her head veiled, uh, and she's a married woman, it's a very, very serious thing. He says you might as well have your head shorn, which was the sign of a prostitute. So he's saying you're living with somebody, and you're acting you're, in the way you're dressed, you're dressing like an unmarried woman while you are married. And he says, I know that you are free to do this, especially as you come before the Lord, because in the Lord's presence, he doesn't regard these uh, customs and these traditions around you. But he, Paul goes on to say, but on the other hand, you are offending people, uh, perhaps other believers who don't have the same knowledge, but certainly those who are unbelievers, they see you in this way. And it's, it's, it's just not right. And you are, in that way, causing shame to come to the Christian gospel. And so, therefore, he says, while you are free from these cultural restraints in your worship, nevertheless, you need to take them into account for the sake of offense, for the sake of the gospel. So the gospel would have no stumbling block, and, the, and there will be effective evangelism. And so he says, any women taking public part in the church's worship should follow the prevailing social customs and do so with their heads veiled. And this is a very important principle because he goes on to say uh, that this, he, they must do this because of the angels and must do this because of submission. And so he actually argues an array back to some of the important spiritual principles of headship and submission and authority in the spiritual realm. So he says, you think that by exercising your freedom in this way, that you are being clever. He says, actually, no, you're going right against everything that the Bible teaches us about spiritual authority. And so we have that understanding then today. When we worship and worship God, uh, we must do so in ways which are not offensive to the customs of the day. And that varies from place to place. It varies from, from position to position. I mean, in some places in the world, it is offensive for men and women to sit together in public places. And so if you go into those churches in that time, it's no good saying, we don't believe this, we don't agree with this, we're going to sit together. That will cause great offense. And you find in some churches, I've preached in churches where the men and women are not allowed to sit together. Has anybody been in a church like that? Okay, many people from, from Africa, it's, it's in that way. How many people have not been in a church like that? Okay, so you, it's, it seems very strange when you walk into a church like that. The men on one side, the women on, on the other side, and you think, what's going on here? But there are customs. Now, in the presence of God, we don't have to... Uh, fulfill those customs. God doesn't expect us to fulfill the customs and traditions of men. But if we are seeking to reach that society, our freedom is something we are willing to leave on one side in order to reach people with the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another example of this is Timothy. He was circumcised by Paul. Now, Paul knew that Timothy didn't have to be circumcised in order to be accepted by God, but he knew that he needed to be circumcised in order to be accepted by the Jewish believers that Paul was trying to reach and the Jewish people that Paul was wanting to reach. Paul himself said, I'm, I become all things to everyone. In other words, to the Jew I become as a Jew, to the Gentile I become as a Gentile, so that I can reach them. And so the freedom that Paul speaks about 
is, is not a freedom that we stand upon, and, and in standing upon that freedom, put a stumbling block in the way of those people who don't yet know Jesus Christ. Then the Apostle Paul deals with the issue of morals and worship. And he's concerned what was happening here in the Lord's Supper in Corinth. Instead of carrying out the instructions which Jesus had given and Paul had passed on to them, these believers seem to be turning the worship service, the Lord's Supper, into an occasion for feasting, for revelry, for, for pagan revelry. And they were bringing their own food to the Lord's Supper, having private feasts within the meeting instead of within their own homes. And uh, the, 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 the pattern probably was this. The wealthy dignitaries in the church, they didn't have to come in late from working in the fields and get themselves all washed and cleaned up. They had all the slaves and the servants to do that. And they were very, very wealthy. So it's the Lord's Supper. Okay, what are we going to take? And so they'd go to the ancient equivalent of a refrigerator and get the most massive meals and probably compete with one another so they'd get the most expensive kind of dishes. And they'd sit down and say, right, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. And they'd dig in and, and eat. And, and the field workers, the slaves and the servants, they were coming in late. They had to get back home, take care of their masters and take care of their work at home and then get washed and cleaned up and they'd be coming later to the meeting. And by that time, the richer folk, they had already eaten and, had, and, and, and you know, Paul says, and the way you were eating was quite outrageous and, and you, you were having more than just a little sip of that communion wine, brother. They were drinking it and some of them were actually getting drunk. And so when their brothers, other brothers came, they were, in the, they were having already in the middle of a party that would represent, be much more representative of a discotheque than the, the, the house of God. And they were getting drunk and stuffing themselves and having no concern about these other people coming in late. And Paul says, this is not the Lord's Supper. This kind of behavior is bringing judgment on you. That's why you're sick and some of you are dying. It's that serious. Paul spoke about the divisions within the church, which he exposed and opposed. And that was now manifesting within the public worship. And as far as Paul was concerned, this division and ungodly revelry was dishonoring the Lord's Supper and the body of Christ. He says, you're not thinking about what you're doing, and you're bringing judgment upon yourselves. Fellowship means sharing. It means participating. And how can you possibly share together like this if you are behaving like that? And uh, the Lord's Supper is in some way a sharing of the sacrifice of Christ. He says that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And just as the Jews relived the experiences of the Exodus in the Passover, so believers participate in the sacrifice of Christ by identifying themselves with it by faith. In, as, they, as they take part in the Lord's Supper. And they were committing themselves for the mission of Christ. That's why it was morally impossible, Paul says, for you to share in both the Lord's Supper and any other form of idol worship. By fellowshipping in Christ's death through the Supper, we're automatically excluded from any fellowship which compromises our position in Christ. Paul's loaf that he speaks about and one body, these ideas that he speaks about in 1 Corinthians 10, make it clear that Christian fellowship includes all who participate in Christ. And all are united in one loaf, in one body. Paul says you are all one body because you participate and share in the one loaf, the one loaf of communion. He says it's one loaf. We do it together, friends, or we don't do it at all, he says. So this, uh, Paul says... The Lord's Supper has an inbuilt requirement for unity. And so there are profound moral and spiritual implications about sharing in the Supper. Quite simply, we should not dare to share in the Lord's Supper if we're not sharing with all others of fellowship in and with Christ. They're very strong statements. And so he says, when you participate this way, you're doing it without discerning the Lord's body, and then you are condemned. Presumably, this refers to those who weren't maintaining the purity of the Lord's body. But also, it would have something to say about those people who were 
left outside of this part of the communion service. And so he says, now listen, two things. First of all, if you're hungry, eat at home. If you can't wait to eat when it's late, if you're used to having your food early and you can't control yourself, then eat your food before you come. You don't come here to stuff yourself. It's the first thing. Second thing he says, and before you eat here, you wait till everybody comes together. So you do this as one body and you acknowledge one another and you discern the Lord's body and receive the Lord's body. That's the body of Christ, the church. This shows that the spiritual dimension of the Lord's Supper is absolutely paramount. And arguments about the size of the bread and the flavor of the wine all miss the point. Paul's teaching is that the Lord's Supper is a spiritual meal and that the spirituality of it should be central in our worship as we come together. It was, as he says, a memorial, which is that active participation in the events which are symbolically represented in the bread and in the wine. In other words, when you take the bread and wine, Paul says, this is a spiritual experience in which all that is represented there comes home to you. The Holy Spirit drives it home to you, seals it in your experience so that you, you engage in the Holy Spirit and, and enjoy something that, what, that you do when you have communion that you can enjoy in that quite the same sense nowhere else. And so as we bring this part of, the, of this section to a conclusion, we're going to pick it up in the next session right from here. Let's remind ourselves that we're talking about worship in spirit and truth, and you can see spiritual mindedness is of paramount importance in every aspect of our life of worship and our service to the living God. Well, that's it for this session. I'm going to uh, get ready for the next session. We'll see you uh, when we come back at this particular point to continue worship in the New Testament. God bless you. And that brings to an end today's teaching on worship in spirit and truth. And I pray that as you've been watching and listening, God has been drawing you closer and closer to himself. There's no greater thing on earth than being a worshiper of the Father in the name of Jesus. And so until next time, goodbye and God bless you.